miss your kind too, Skarner. Would you like to hear their song? You know, I still can't quite believe that nobody apparently took a look at that line and realized that it was going to be a problem. Hello, pop stars and perfectionists. My name is TB Skine, and uh, boy, I'm a little late to this party, aren't I? Well, to be fair, I made plenty of videos about Seraphine back when she was relevant, but the actual What's the Deal video, which I've promised for a while, yeah, that one took a little while, but it's just, you know, some stuff got in the way, like a pandemic and all the stuff happening in the America where I don't live, but it's important that I keep up with it. And also, I decided to read through all of One Piece again from the beginning, which... I don't know if you've heard, but that's actually a long manga. Anyway, the actual reason for my procrastination is that when it comes to Seraphine, there is a lot to talk about, as evidenced by the three videos I've already done about her trying to talk about some of all of the everything that there is to talk about with Seraphine. So, the way that I've decided to structure this video is that we will do a lore and a character design section and all the rest of it as normal, and then we will give the problems, their own special little section. That's where we will talk about the whole thing about Skarner and the retcon of her lore and all of the drama that surrounded that. But to start with, we will read the character on her own terms and ask the question. Seraphine is the child of Saw Knights, who have moved their lives to Piltover in search of a better future. They run a modest Hexcoustics repair shop, which basically means that they fix stereos for wealthy Piltovans. And that connection to sound and music carries over into the thematics of Seraphine herself, because she is born with an unnaturally acute sense of hearing and an even greater sense of empathy. Unfortunately, what this means in practice is that when she listens to the sounds of a bustling city like Piltover, it all becomes too much. Because not only is she hearing the sounds of the city, but the sounds of people's very souls. Now, Piltover and Son, in case you haven't been keeping up with the lore, are not exactly cities in, uh, harmony. Because Piltover is a shining technological utopian city on a hill, controlled by a vicious upper class of inbred nobles who will send assassins after anyone they perceive as threatening their power. Meanwhile, Son is a high industrial poisoned hellscape of toxic fumes, child labor, and the brutal oppression of the chem barons and their criminal gangs. Consequently, the sound that Piltover Piltover and Son produced to Seraphine's ears is an overwhelming cacophony so deafening and overpowering that she can barely go outside. Fortunately, Piltover is the city of progress, and there's no problem that can't be solved using the stolen piece of a soul of an innocent creature that was murdered in its sleep in order to power the rise of a capitalistic city-state. But we'll come back to that later. As it stands, her loving parents save up a lot of money to buy her a shard of a Hextech crystal, a rare Hextech crystal, and using it, they craft a device, essentially a pair of headphones, as it were, that dampen and silence the sounds of the city and allow her to live a somewhat normal life. Except, in that silence, she hears something. A bit of the consciousness that is trapped within the Hextech crystal. The voice of the Brackern. Skarner's species. She can only really hear the voice vaguely, but its guidance and its mastery over song, which is how Skarner's species communicates, helps her to learn to manage her own gift and problem, giving her the ability to filter out the overwhelming noise without the dampener that her parents constructed. And with her natural gift for music, she begins to venture out into Piltover and Son and play, trying to listen to the city to understand why it is all so discordant. She wants to try and help fix things, mend them, make Piltover and Son come together in harmony. And to that end, she constructs a platform using the same crystal that was once in her dampener that helps amplify her abilities, her ability to cause harmony to happen. And with that new platform, and as she becomes better and better as a performer and entertainer, she becomes essentially Piltover's first pop star, someone who can bring together the two cities, people from all walks of life united to, uh, well, it doesn't really say, I guess to be fans of 
Seraphine? Yeah, well, we'll leave that for the later section when we talk about the problems. For now, what matters is that Seraphine is the starry-eyed songstress, a young, naive girl who thinks that the world can be fixed with song, music, and poetry and togetherness, and who believes in this cause with absolute sincerity, and who just might have enough power in her to make it happen in spite of everything. That's how the character is written, and that is how we will analyze her. I think Seraphine's sincerity, the fact that she genuinely believes in what she's doing and how she's trying to achieve it, is an important factor when it comes to assessing her character design. Because looking at it, it is... It's a lot. Like, there is a lot going on with Seraphine. There's a lot of color, there's a lot of glitter, there's a lot of extraneous details, and there's a lot of, well, silliness and childishness in there. She is in many ways a Lisa Frank painting come to life, or a character from the My Little Pony Friendship is Magic show transplanted into Runeterra. From the dip-dyed purple and pink hair, to the sparkly dress, to the mismatched leggings, and straight-up Star Guardian costume aesthetic, it is a valid criticism, I think, to say that she really doesn't feel like anything that would come from the aesthetics of either Piltover or Son. Those two regions are defined First of all, by a sort of steampunky, quasi-Victorian Edwardian aesthetic circa England in the 1800s, but in Piltover also by a high-tech by way of Rococo art movement aesthetic, and in Son, much more of an explicitly punk-influenced aesthetic, and indeed a working-class-influenced aesthetic. Seraphine's aesthetic, by contrast, is much more directly influenced by modern things, like I said, Star Guardians, which are based on magical girls, but also the aesthetics of a modern, peppy, light-hearted, too sweet for her own good Disney Channel slash Japanese idol wholesome pop star. And that is who she is. That is very much who this character is. So from a character design perspective, I can't really say that the character design is doing a bad job. The trade-off, though, for all this accuracy in presenting her character is that it doesn't do a good job of world-building. It doesn't do a good job of integrating with and furthering the aesthetics and the ideas of Rune Terra as a whole and Piltover and Son in the specific. And the reason why I'm being so magnanimous in well, not quite defending, but certainly trying to explain her character design, is that in the aftermath of Seraphine's release, I saw a number of people try to, air quotes, fix her character design, primarily by leaning more into the world building, by making her look more like she comes from Piltover and Son. And these fixes are absolutely valid criticisms of the character design. It's a valid criticism to say that Seraphine does a bad job of world building for Rune Terra. But I don't think the right framing of these discussions should ever be fixing the character design, because it really isn't a matter of right or wrong answers, it's a matter of which trade-offs you're willing to take on any given design decision. Having said all that, I prefer most of the fixes, frankly. I do think she looks way too much like she comes from the Star Guardian universe, and not at all like she comes from Piltover and Son. And in terms of trade-offs, I think this is more of a problem than a benefit to the character design. Because yes, you're leaning in really, really hard to her being a pop star, but the reason why she's a pop star, the thing that she wants to do, is unify Piltover and Son. And if you can't tell from her character design that she comes from both cities, that she the child of Sawnite immigrants to Piltover who's trying to straddle both worlds and unify them, then you're not really doing a great job of telling the character's story, even if you're doing a good job of communicating the character's personality. So yeah, I would like to see some more inspiration from the punk aesthetics of the music scene in Sawn, as we have seen in the Legends of Rune Terra cards. I'd like to see some more petticoats and sort of Edwardian Victorian ideas of feminine grace and beauty. I would like to see some more into integration between her as a character and the people and cities that act as her primary motivation. Outside of that, 
physically, I wish she wasn't so boring. Like, she's a quirky shut-in kid who can't connect with anyone, and then she, like, figures out that she has a talent for music, and then she becomes a pop star, and it's like, she doesn't really look like someone who's ever had trouble living up to the ideals of the outside world. She's skinny, she's pretty, she looks like a Disney princess, she looks like the popular girl in every goddamn high school, she looks like the leader of the cheer team. In other words, she doesn't look like someone who would ever have trouble fitting into a society. She looks like someone who conforms to every possible beauty standard. And as someone whose whole story is about awkwardly straddling the differences between the two worlds of Piltover and Son, of not really fitting in, but having like an optimistic vision about creating a space where everybody can fit in, no matter how different they are, it's a little bit weird that just in terms of her character design, she looks so incredible incredibly conformist to the most basic beauty ideals that dominate in character design today. And like, I think Seraphine's specific very high femme aesthetic is not overrepresented in League the same way that sexy titty babes are. So you could maybe argue that that's something new she brings to female character design in League of Legends, except I still feel like that aesthetic is very heavily overrepresented both in League of Legends skins, but also in the wider gaming space. And that's the thing, video games have plenty of room for girls and women who look like Seraphine. And for me, that context just grinds against the idea of Seraphine as an outsider trying to unify two cities that are essentially designed to be mirror opposites of one another. I guess what I was looking for is for Seraphine's design to contain some more interesting contradictions instead of all this non-threatening agreeability. Anyway, much as I may try, I guess we can't put it off any longer we have to talk about. Hextech crystals are made of people. Well, not all of them. Most Hextech crystals that exist in Piltover and Son, and indeed the world of Runeterra, are synthetic Hextech crystals. They are copies of the original Hextech crystals, which were invented and primarily manufactured by Camille's family, the Pharos clan, an ancient and very powerful noble house in Piltover. But the original Hextech crystals, the crystals that the synthetics were made to copy, are made of the Brackern. To cut a long story short, Skarner's people, the Brackern, are formed around the nexuses of powerful crystals that contain the joined consciousness of his entire species, and they primarily communicate through song. Explorers from the Pharaoh's clan found Skarner's people sleeping beneath the deserts of, I believe, Shirima, and decided to start mining the Brackern bodies, and took the resulting crystals back with them to Piltover for research and development. The origin of the Hextech crystals is a closely guarded secret of Clan Pharaohs, because the revelation that living creatures were harvested to create Hextech technology would, you know, be a pretty bad look overall. Besides that, the production of the synthetic Hextech crystals is rumored, at least according to Camille's lore, to be a big contributor to what's called the Son Grey, which is a blanket of toxic fumes that hangs over the entire lower city of Zon, poisoning everyone. So, when Seraphine gets her hands on at least a shard of a true Hextech crystal, a crystal that contains the consciousness of the Brackern, and which seems to communicate with her, and talk to her, and tell her something about the nature of the Brackern and their history and what happened to them, it raises an uncomfortable question. Does Seraphine know that she's using the soul of a dead people to power first her dampening headphones that let her hear, and then the literal stage that she steps upon in order to power her career as a pop star? Well, in Seraphine's lore, there are multiple references to the Hextech crystal speaking directly to her, sharing the wisdom of the Brackern and being a constant guiding voice in her life that she could ask for advice and expect answers in return. And if Seraphine was just an ordinary person, it would be strange enough that she has been told the Rune Terran equivalent of finding out that your smartphone is powered by the soul of an innocent baby and yet somehow decides to not only keep using the soul of that baby to power her smartphone, but also, like, use that smartphone to start a TikTok career without ever mentioning to anyone that, hey, all our smartphones are powered by baby souls! It would be strange enough 
if she was a normal person, but Seraphine, the thing that makes her a champion, the thing that makes her exceptional, the thing that makes her stand out, is that she is an empath. More than anything else, she cares about other people. She listens to them, she internalizes their pain, and she wants to heal them. And yet, she finds out that there is the soul of a murdered, brutalized people trapped inside the technology that powers the foundations of her society, and she does nothing. A lot of people reacted to this by calling Seraphine a number of bad words, basically. Calling her evil, calling her cruel, calling her a monster. But Seraphine isn't a monster. The problem here isn't whether or not Seraphine is a good person because, well, because she's not a real person. She doesn't have a morality. She's just a character. She only has whatever morality is ascribed to her by her writers, and her writers very explicitly wrote her to be a good person. The problem is that the lore that she has, the backstory, and the world building that surrounds her accidentally create some really dark and unfortunate implications that were not taken fully into account before her lore was finalized. Riot weren't trying with Seraphine to create some kind of stealth criticism of celebrity culture where celebrities pretend they care about other people, but they only care about using other people for their own ends. Haha. -ha. Like, that would be really cool if they were trying to do that, but that's not what happened. What happened is somewhere, somehow, someone got some wires crossed about the exact implications of each part of the lore, it got published, and it created an unforeseen problem. It happens. Having said that, League of Legends is still a $1.7 billion IP. It's one of the biggest games on the face of the Earth. Riot has more money than God. And it is fair to give them shit for making mistakes like this and expecting them to fix them and prevent them from happening in the future. Up to and including, by the way, giving their narrative teams more budget, more manpower, and more of a voice in the decision-making process when it comes to creating product for the League of Legends universe, which, according to the anecdotes that I've heard, they don't often get to have. Anyway, Riot did eventually respond to the whole trouble with Seraphine and the Brackern, Apparently, only after Mark Merrill, Trindamir himself, one of the co-founders of Riot, learned about the problem, read up on the issue, and said on Twitter that he thought that was dumb and should be fixed. Now, it's entirely probable that Riot was working on some kind of solution internally before Trindamir spoke out on Twitter, but the way that it looked from the outside is that the problem only got fixed because someone high up in the company happened to notice people discussing it on social media. Of course, I say that they fixed the problem, but what did they actually do? Well, they changed approximately eight sentences in her lore, and the primary effect of those changes is to give Seraphine plausible deniability. Instead of the lore simply saying that the voice she hears was kind, it says that though hard to hear and harder to comprehend, the voice was kind. And rather than saying that the voice helped Seraphine understand how to resonate with a crowd, it now says that the voice rarely spoke clearly, but Seraphine felt its influence as it helped her. And as a wonderful little cherry on top, they change this segment. Persuading her parents to help, she dismantled her dampener, and together they repurposed the crystal to power its opposite, a platform that would amplify her gifts, not repress them. That segment gets changed to, Persuading her parents to help, she dismantled her dampener, and together they gave the crystal a new home in its opposite, a platform that would amplify her gifts, not repress them. How nice! Instead of repurposing the crystal like they're using an object for a purpose, which is what they actually did, now they're giving the crystal a nice new home! It's it's nice there! It likes it! It's a, it's a wonderful platform, it's got a lovely interior, it's all decorated, there's a, there's a bath en suite, and like a pool, and it's very happy, and please don't ask it about anything, it's, it's totally doing fine, don't worry about it. This is a fix that I would call the path of least resistance, because rather than address the issue or try to incorporate it into her story, it simply sidesteps the whole issue by saying, well, Seraphine doesn't know about it, which means she can't do anything about it, so it's a pointless discussion and let's just not have it and stop thinking about it. And taking the perspective of the writer for a second, I can understand 
coming to this solution because you've got the co-founder of the company calling you out on Twitter, creating a huge stir. You've got this issue that is all of a sudden derailing the publishing plans for the rest of the rollout for this champion who's like the centerpiece, not only of the whole KDA thing that you've got going on with music videos and tie-ins and sponsorships and promotions, but also the major centerpiece of your world's performance for the biggest esports event that the entire company is going to put on all year. I can only imagine the stress and pressure that must have come down to fix this as quickly and as quietly and as non-disruptively as possible. So I don't blame the writers for taking this quick and easy way out. I think it's a weak fix that just kicks the problem down the road without actually addressing the issue that's present in the lore. But that's not any one writer's fault. That's Riot's fault. Anyway, I have already made videos about the ways in which I think this issue could be fixed that are better and more interesting than the quick little patch job that Riot had to come up with. So let's move on from criticizing Seraphine's part of the lore and talk about how Riot is currently handling Piltover and Zaun as a whole. The conflict between Piltover and Zaun is, in my opinion, one of the more interesting parts of League of Legends lore. The ways in which it informs the champions and characters that reside there have the potential for a whole bunch of genuinely very good storytelling. But Riot's approach to framing the conflict has overall been very neutral, very well, here's what one side thinks and here's what the other side thinks, without ever really explicitly taking sides or declaring one side the villain. And this is, of course, a pretty common approach to storytelling. By not explicitly taking any sides, you can allow the audience a, air quotes, neutral viewpoint from which they can form their own conclusions with an understanding of the motivations that would lead each side to behave the way that they do. But the trouble is, unlike something like Demacia and Noxus, these cities aren't two houses both alike in dignity in Fair Piltover and Sawn where we lay our scene. They aren't Montagues and Capulets feuding over ancient irrelevant slights. The conflict between Piltover and Sawn is very explicitly written to be a class conflict. Champions like Caitlyn and Camille are written specifically to be members of a sort of quasi-Victorian Edwardian upper class. They're members of the nobility of Piltover. And Camille specifically launched with a comic wherein she assassinates a member of the Chem Barons of Son who's trying to marry into one of the noble Piltover families because she can't stand the idea of a filthy Sonite working his way into power in the delicate and refined politics of Piltover. Similarly, even with champions like Echo and Seraphine herself, we see elements whereby their well-meaning parents are trying to escape Son to secure a better future for their children as members of not necessarily the upper class, but at the very least, the middle class. Seraphine's parents save up everything they have just to get out of Son and start a little independent business, and Echo's parents are trying to send him off to college to give him a good education so he can be the one that finally breaks the family's long cycle of poverty. Piltover and Son is a story about class conflict right down to appropriating the visual signifiers of class to tell their stories. As we mentioned when we talked about Seraphine's character design, in Zon, there's often an appropriation of punk aesthetics, which once upon a time, at least, were very heavily associated with the working class, especially in England. In Piltover, meanwhile, everyone's walking around in frocks and petticoats and fancy shirts with monocles and top hats, like they're all part of some Downton Abbey steampunk AU. So at some point, that has to enter into Seraphine's story, because Seraphine's idealism, as it is expressed, is that she wants to get everybody together. She wants to bridge the gap between the Piltovans and the Sawnites. She wants to inspire people. She wants to raise up their voices. Raise up their voices, though, to say what, exactly? She wants to inspire them to do what, exactly? She wants to bring them together in unity around what 
Because no matter how good of a singer she is, no matter how wonderful a concert she puts on, no matter how much people sing in harmony, that doesn't change the fact that half of her audience still has to live in Zon. They go home to a place that is covered in poison smog, where people starve to death if they aren't killed first by the roving gangs of violent thugs employed by the chem barons, and where children and orphans have to walk into chemical swamps to scavenge for scraps just to get through the day. The people of Zon aren't angry at Piltover because, oh, them darn Pilties, they're so arrogant, we don't like them very much. They're angry because they're dying. And, of course, it's completely okay for Seraphine not to fully understand this. She is the starry-eyed songstress. She doesn't have to come preloaded with a 12-point action plan and a political ideology that's gonna solve all the problems in Piltover and Zon. It is okay for her to be a young artist who's just trying to do the best she can with her art. Because being young, naive, and idealistic are positive qualities. These are the kinds of things that will let her look at the conflict between Piltover and Zon with fresh eyes and focus on finding solutions that help people rather than getting bogged down in petty disputes and grievances and old feuds. But all Riot is letting her do is just say, I want everybody to come together in harmony and sing and then we'll all understand each other and then... Uh, uh, uh. And this is part of what makes the whole Brackern thing extra disappointing because right there was a golden opportunity to make Seraphine someone of real consequence in Piltover. Seraphine is a character of empathy, someone who cares about other people, so why not have that be the focus of the thing that she does? Why not make her a protest singer, someone who creates unity between Piltover and Zon by letting the people of Piltover know how the people of Zon are suffering, letting them know that children are starving to death and something can and should be done about it. Make her an active force in Piltover politics, not by making her a politician, but by making her someone who articulates the suffering of the lowest in a way that those who are higher up cannot ignore. Empathy and the ability to generate empathy in others is incredibly powerful. It's the kind of thing that should threaten to overturn the entire order of Piltover and Zon. Seraphine is just written as this nice, happy pop star who wants people to feel good for a while when she should be written as an actual force to be reckoned with. Camille should be shaking in her metal-bladed boots every time she hears that Seraphine is putting on a benefit concert for Sawnites. Characters like Echo and Vi and Hell Caitlyn should be her fans. They should be around to help protect her from the retaliations of the Piltovan upper class. There's an opportunity to make character connections of which she has none. Like, that's another thing that bothers me about what Riot has done to Seraphine. She has no character connections except to Skarner. And we've kind of already seen how that's a bit of a problem. There is so much potential with Seraphine. Thematically, she could be the polar opposite to Urgot. Urgot currently is essentially trying to organize a fascist hate mob in Son. He's essentially spreading a might-makes-right ideology of only the strong survive, and Seraphine is the perfect counterpart to that. She can be the person who says, no, you know what? Everyone has a right to live. Your might-makes-right bullshit is just gonna take down one upper class and replace it with another set of oppressors, and we don't want any of that. Her superpower is the ability to make people empathize with each other. That should mean so much more than just, I'm gonna sing a song and make everybody feel good for a little while. That should be a call to action. But no, no, I guess we're just gonna lean into the stereotype that pop singers are irrelevant and that their music don't matter and they're disposable and all that they can really do is make people feel good for a little while without affecting any real change in the world, sure. And to bring it back to the Brackern thing for a second, Seraphine is an empath who learns that part of Piltover's technology is built on the suffering of a silent group of people that nobody else can hear except her. And I just think, what better origin story for a protest singer? She should be Skarner's natural ally in Piltover, his friend, someone who cares about the suffering of his people and who's damn well gonna make other people care as well because she's a good person. But. No, I mean, I guess Mark Merrill is just going to go on Twitter and throw his writers under the bus, and instead we get this quick patchwork fix that throws out one of the most interesting parts of her character in favor of making her non-threatening.
Seraphine is not a bad character. Like, I think there's a lot of choices being made here that I don't find very interesting. I think there's a lot of good opportunities that are just kind of sailing by without anyone even bothering to take a swing at them. But she's not a bad character. The idea of a singer trying to bring a scattered people together around common ideas and ideals is really powerful, but because Riot doesn't really seem to know what those ideals are supposed to be, Seraphine's story ends up looking kind of harmless and toothless. Seraphine is mostly frustrating. Like a lot of other League of Legends characters, I can see so much potential and so many good ideas at play that Riot just doesn't seem interested in trying to explore. And it's especially frustrating when the idea of using empathy as a power is such a compelling antidote to the million miles of mostly identical cynical anti-heroes that we usually get spoon-fed with in pop culture. And as one final note, by the way, I don't want to see anyone in my comments saying, well, Riot can't make a protest singer because of Tencent and China, because first of all, nobody in my comment section on YouTube.com is an expert in Chinese soft power and censorship politics. And second of all, Western corporations don't need foreign governments pressuring them into being creatively cowardly. Look at Ubisoft, look at Activision, and not for nothing, but Riot's management has been forcing their staff to pitch these kinds of softballs since long before Tencent acquired a controlling stake in the company. Thank you very much for watching another episode of What's... Hello, pop stars and perfectionists. My name is TB Skyne, and uh, boy, I'm a little late to this one, aren't I? Well, to be fair, I made plenty of videos about Seraphine back when she was relevant, but the actual What's the Deal video, well, that took a little while because there's just so much to talk about when it comes to this champion. In fact, so much that I might have to make, I don't know, two entire episodes to cover it all. Anyway, because there is a lot of stuff to get through, the way I've decided to structure this is that first we will talk about the lore and the character design of Seraphine as normal, and then we'll have a separate section to talk about her Twitter account, the whole virtual influencer thing, and all of the other stuff that happened around her outside of the game. So, let's start by talking about... KDA Seraphine is created around a very potent fantasy. The fantasy of being a young, struggling ingenue, trying to get noticed with your song covers and your art trying to get the world to pay attention to what you have to say, when your favorite stars in the whole entire world, the people you've looked up to more than anything else for your entire life, discover you and lift you up and declare you their equal, that you may stand on the stage next to them and share in their amazing view of the world. As wish fulfillment fantasies go, this one is pure ambrosia. Because what kit hasn't had that fantasy that their favorite pop star of all time would notice them and invite them up on stage and say, hey, you're cool, and then you can hang out and you could be friends and you could have adventures. Wouldn't that be amazing? And yes, it is in some ways kind of a childish and slightly naive fantasy, but that doesn't make it any less powerful. I mean, Marvel essentially structured the entirety of the Tom Holland Spider-Man franchise around this same central idea. What if the coolest Avenger ever, Tony Stark, he's the, the man with the, who snaps the thing and says, I'm Iron Man. What if he decided to be like your friend and he brought you in to be superhero and you can hang out and do cool stuff? Same fantasy, different setting. And to tell that story, Seraphine is expressed in three primary different venues. First, there is the comic Harmonies, which is both a broad KDA comic about all the members of the group, but also very specifically an origin story for Seraphine. Then there's the bios of the three versions of her skin, which tell some of the story of the character along with the character design. And then there's her Twitter account. Now, like I said, we'll discuss the virtual influencer parasocial relationship thing about the Twitter account in a separate section, but for the purposes of the storytelling around KDA Seraphine, her Twitter account acts as a sort of layer of metafiction on top of what's already being published inside official Riot channels. 
And the vast majority of what Seraphine tweets is the kind of stuff that you probably would expect a young, idealistic, artistic, positive dreamer to tweet on their Twitter account, which is to say lots of really cozy looking selfies, pictures of her cat, vibes and aesthetic, and of course, tons and tons of retweets of things that are popular on the internet or stuff that's somehow related to creativity or indie music. She also technically has an Instagram account, but it's mostly posting all the same images that she puts on her Twitter and not really adding anything to any of them. And the point of all of this is to establish Seraphine as someone who is hashtag relatable, at least at first. Someone who lives a relatively ordinary life and does all of the relatively ordinary things that you do when you are a young adult with a creative soul still looking for their place in the world and also about as edgy as a glass of milk and two cookies. So, in her chapter of the Harmonies comic, we see Seraphine's life before KDA. Basically, just a relatively ordinary young woman working in a coffee shop to make ends meet, and then busking in her off time to develop her skills while posting covers and creative things on the internet. She struggles, like many people do, with a feeling of uncertainty and a lack of direction, and her parents, while well-meaning and supportive, are constantly asking her if it's not about time that she moved on to something more real than this holding pattern she's been stuck in for ages and ages, which of course is a frustrating thing to hear when you're still trying to figure things out for yourself. Then one day, from her perspective completely out of nowhere, she gets a call from Ari of KDA, who somehow has gotten a hold of her phone number and invites her to join them for a collaboration for KDA's big new EP. Now, unbeknownst to Seraphine, Ari had actually been looking for quite a while for a new voice voice, some kind of new thing to add to KDA, a perspective that the group was missing when one day Evelyn sends her a video of Seraphine's cover of Pop Stars. A cover which is just so good and unique and interesting that Ari, quite frankly, is struck by inspiration and immediately decides to ask Seraphine to join them in the studio. From there, Seraphine's story is about adjusting to life in the studio with this amazing pop group that she's been idolizing, making connections with the different band members, and struggling a little bit with the fear and nervousness that naturally comes with suddenly stepping on to such a big new stage. The transformation of Seraphine from bedroom ingenue to international pop star creates the basis of her three different forms. As KDA rising star Seraphine Indie, which is a bit of a mouthful, her stage is all wooden and acoustic covered in fairy lights. She's wearing a simple comfy sweater with a cardigan tied around her waist and scuffed jeans rolled up to the knees. And color-wise, she's mostly defined by warm hues, especially the bright pink of her hair, but also the relatively downbeat energy of a white sweater, black pants, and that pastel violet cardigan. Contrasting that with KDA All Out Rising star Seraphine, one of the most notable and immediate changes is the total change in color temperature around her. She retains most of the pink hair and she still has a white top on, but blue has started to sneak in all over her character design. Mixing with the pink in the accents on her dress and the flowers that dot her platform, and her platform itself, by the way, has transitioned from the warm wooden tones of an indie bedroom acoustic guitar to an actual proper speaker system. The end point of this transformation comes in KDA All Out Seraphine Superstar where the colder blue color has completely taken over her color scheme and her color temperature. Seraphine now is primarily identified with the turquoise of her hair and the various colder pink, purple, and violet colors that now dominate her costuming. The crystal aesthetics of KDA proper have also found their way into her character design, not the least in her stage, which has transitioned completely away from being either an acoustic guitar or a speaker system into becoming entirely a platform, a stage for her to show her stuff. And what's a little bit interesting about KDA All Out Seraphine in her forms is that normally this transformation away from warmth of color towards coldness would be coded as a bad thing. Like it would be the rise of someone walking into the world of superstardom and being corrupted by it and forgetting their roots and no longer remembering their friends. And this would be the source of drama and conflict and represent a kind of fall from grace from which they would have to attempt to recover in order to truly find themselves, but 
KDA Seraphine doesn't really show any signs of that. The transformation that she undergoes from a relatable homebody indie girl to international superstar is a transformation not away from authenticity, but towards a new form of authenticity. This is not Seraphine corrupted, this is just Seraphine realized. And that at least is a relatively novel take on the idea. Fame and fortune not as some kind of dark seduction that must be resisted in favor of modest virtues, but as something to which you can genuinely aspire and realize happiness through. And as a series of character designs, All Out Seraphine's three different forms really do a pretty good job of telling that story of transformation and self-realization. The transition in color hues away from the warm and the pink, which is comfortable, but perhaps also a little bit safe and perhaps childish, towards the colder, sharper blue and crystal of her final pop star form is a genuinely quite clever way to signal the transition, transformation and progression of Seraphine as a character through the various phases of her career. Having said all that, obviously I agree with most people that it's kind of disappointing that she has these three forms, but you can only access one of them per game, that you're basically just buying a three pack of skins instead of something unique that can swap between forms, maybe depending on your performance in game. Now, I don't necessarily disbelieve Riot when they say that they have technical reasons why they want to scale back the ultimate skins a little bit, but no matter how true those concerns may be, that doesn't really change the fact that something like KDA All Out Seraphine feels a lot lower value than something like DJ Sona. Anyway, surprising absolutely nobody, I'm going to pair this praise of KDA Seraphine with also just a little bit of criticism of the way Riot has handled her. So the title of this segment is obviously a little bit hyperbolic, but I do kind of mean it. Seraphine as a character aesthetic, Seraphine as a singer, Seraphine's part on the more single were sold to us by Riot and told to us in the lore as being the missing pieces, the one thing that KDA was missing, the spark they needed to get them going. And then you actually look at Seraphine next to the rest of KDA and she doesn't look that different. And you hear her part in the more single, And it doesn't sound that different. Now, don't get me wrong, the singer in question has a good voice, like they, they, they sing nicely. It's just, what part of what Seraphine does on more could not have been done by either Ari or Evelyn. So within the fiction of KDA, the way the group works is that each individual member brings something unique to the table. So Ari is the seasoned pop star with a long career behind her who has decided to break free from corporate control and really say something with her music and really get a message out there unfettered by the control of her previous handlers. Evelyn, on the other hand, brings the raw sexual energy. She's the dark diva of the group and handles that part of the appeal. Kaisa is the choreographer and dancer, and Akali brings hip hop and rap and that particular side of music into the equation. So what is it that Seraphine brings? What's her specialty, the thing that she does better than anyone else that makes her necessary for KDA? Now, I'll admit that I'm not a music expert, and maybe there was some substantial difference between her vocal performance on More and the other two singers, but besides the language that she was speaking, I certainly couldn't tell. Seraphine's verse, at least according to the translations I've been able to find, sort of echoes the idea that she's the every woman, like the ordinary person who's looking at this pop star life with, I guess, a more grounded perspective, and she's kind of overwhelmed by it all, which, that's sort of half of an interesting idea, but because Seraphine never really gets to do anything more than that little interstitial before the final chorus on the song, we don't really get a sense of, of what her personality is really supposed to be here. 
like with Akali, you understand that she brings a whole different genre to the table. With Kaisa, you understand the idea is that she's the choreographer, the person who has the visual imagination, who coordinates their looks and who manages their dance routines, which are like a big part of what a pop group does. And so the thing that baffles me is, what exactly was Seraphine supposed to bring to the table here? What's the big transformation that she causes in KDA that launches them out of their long hiatus and back onto the world stage? Because, frankly, I ain't seeing it. But, again, I have to admit some level of ignorance. I am not an expert on K-pop, and I'm certainly not an expert on pop music. There might just be something massive and obvious to everyone else that I'm missing here. So let's pivot away from the song itself and instead talk about the comics and the lore. How do they explore the idea that Seraphine is bringing something new to KDA? Well, they don't. The extent of Seraphine's contribution to KDA in the comic is pretty much what I've already told you. Ari sees that she did a cover of Pop Stars, and then she's like, oh, we must have her in the studio. And then she goes to the studio and she sings and they say, yay, that was really nice. And then that that's it. Like there's never they never discuss what it is that Seraphine is supposed to bring. Is it is it authenticity? Is it being down to earth? Is it her indie pop aesthetic? Is it like what is the thing that Ari saw in her? There's never any discussion of it. Ari never articulates it even to the other members of KDA why it's so important that this new girl that nobody has ever heard of be added to the lineup. We're just sort of told that, no, Seraphine is definitely special, just trust us on this one, and then we go from there. And like, it's not like I needed like a really complicated, well thought out, super specific reason why Seraphine was the missing piece. I just wanted anyone to articulate it, like say anything about, like say that she's, she has a more raw vocal performance or that, that she has a different energy or that like there should just be any, any, any discussion whatsoever of what it is that Seraphine brings, but there never is. And it's kind of driving me a little bit insane because that's the whole core of the story. Like the whole reason, the whole justification for having Seraphine in the first place is that she brings something new and they never, ever, at any point whatsoever, take any time to talk about it. And so I'm just kind of grasping at straws here that, okay, it's probably that she's indie pop, where Ari is much more like sort of the high K-pop, I guess. Like, I just have to assume, because what else could it could maybe be? Like, in terms of, of what Seraphine's supposed to bring to the group as a storytelling device is that she's the one who struggles with insecurity and self-doubt and mental health problems, which is a thing we'll talk about at length later as well, except no, because Ari's song, I'll Show You, was about struggling with self-doubt and mental health problems, so Seraphine doesn't even bring that. So what is it? What does Seraphine bring to KDA? I don't, if you know, please tell me in the comments because I've been racking my brain. I've been listening to the song over and over again and I genuinely can't tell. And again, this is not a criticism of Seraphine's singer. It's not even really a criticism of any of the work that was published. Like the comics around Seraphine and KDA, the Harmony comics, they're really good. It's just that I don't get the sense from any of the material around Seraphine that there was ever a clear idea at Riot themselves why Seraphine should be necessary to add to the group, except that they thought it would be really hype if they made a new champion and added her to KDA. The need for Seraphine didn't seem to come from anything KDA was missing, but from a desire from Riot to add something new so they could use it to sell an ultimate skin. And I think we should probably talk a little bit more about that. Now, because I've just implied that Seraphine as an ultimate skin was merely a cash grab without a strong artistic idea driving her, I feel I should clarify something. The people who worked on Seraphine, the writers, the artists, the programmers, the riggers, the animators, they weren't doing this just for a quick buck. Like, they weren't just trying to cash in on something cheap. They were trying to do the best job that they could on the task that was assigned to them under the circumstances that were available. And in this instance, those circumstances were probably quite restrictive because I'm just gonna go out on a limb here and say that Seraphine was conceived first as a member of KDA and an ultimate skin and a tie-in promotional opportunity for Worlds, and then second 
as an actual character who adds something creative to the League of Legends and KDA universes. So, why do I think this? Well, first of all, because I have two eyes in my head and I can see the way that Riot rolled out the character. She was introduced, pitched, marketed, and sold as a member of KDA first. That was the whole salesman's pitch for the entire character, is that she's the new member of KDA and she means that there's going to be new KDA singles and, oh, also, they're going to perform at Worlds. Isn't that exciting? That was the entire point and premise of the rollout of Seraphine as a character, and everything that had to do with Rune Terra itself came later as an afterthought. Which, again, doesn't mean that the people who worked on Seraphine's Rune Terra incarnation weren't doing the best job that they could, just that from the way that Riot published this character, it was pretty freaking clear where their priorities were as a company. So Seraphine was created as a marketing gimmick first, and that I think is at the root of a lot of the problems with the character because all the vagueness that I've been complaining about, how Rune Terra Seraphine wants to unite Piltover and Sun, and how KDA Seraphine is supposed to be special and unique and she brings something special to the group by that kind of vagueness is the hallmark of a character whose existence was essentially mandated by committee. Seraphine wasn't made a pop star in Piltover and Sun because people at Riot had long been thinking that Piltover and Zon really needed a pop star. She was made a pop star in Piltover and Zon because that was the best solution the writer could find under the circumstances when they were being told to add a pop star to the League of Legends universe regardless of whether or not one would fit in there. Similarly, KDA Seraphine wasn't added to KDA because KDA was really missing something and they needed something new and special. She was added to KDA because the company's strategy for promoting the new KDA single was to tie it in with the release of a new champion. That's why she has nothing meaningful to add to the group because the group wasn't missing anything. And in saying all of this, I do want to recognize that, at least on paper, the idea of Seraphine is actually kind of good. Like, KDA Pop Stars was one of the biggest things that Riot ever put out in terms of wider cultural appeal, and the idea of using the huge deal that would be a new KDA single being released to release also a new champion to the community is something that, theoretically, could generate a crap ton of hype and be a really great moment. But an idea working on paper doesn't necessarily mean it works in practice, because all of the practical concerns, the problem that KDA really wasn't missing anything, the problem that Riot clearly didn't have a clear idea of what they wanted a pop star to do in Piltover and Zon, those issues and problems were just swept aside by excited executives in the hopes that the massive hype of the overarching probably pretty good idea would make up for the whole thing, and for my money, it didn't. And another consequence of Seraphine being conceived first and foremost as a member of KDA and therefore as a marketing gimmick to a certain extent is that from that perspective, it makes perfect sense to make her a virtual influencer. On October 10th, 2020, Seraphine tweeted the following. We're going to Shanghai in two days and it's finally setting in all at once. I've been working so hard and I've been trying my best to love myself, but I still can't find the confidence I need. I'm realizing that I can't do this alone, and maybe I need to be the one to ask for help, so could you give me some encouraging words? I need something to believe in right now. One day later, on the 11th, she followed up with this image, with the caption, I don't think I'll ever be fully ready, but I know there's people believing in me, and that's more than enough, Purple Heart. Thank you so much. I mean it sincerely. I'm gonna face this head on. Pictured on the corkboard there, surrounded by flowers being currently sniffed by her adorable cat Bao, are various tweets from people who responded to her call for encouraging words, which she has printed out on paper, cut into awkward little shapes, and apparently put onto a sort of mood board to encourage herself. Of course, Seraphine didn't actually do any of this, because Seraphine isn't a real person. Seraphine didn't read any of the encouraging words that she asked for, and she wasn't heartened by them. None of them gave her a warm feeling inside, and they certainly didn't help her overcome her anxiety, because she doesn't have any anxiety to overcome, because she's not real. The tweets in question started making the rounds with a lot of people, including myself, expressing some, let's call it discomfort, that a virtual fake person was affecting, faking real, actual mental health problems in order to farm retweets and engagement for an advertising campaign. 
Besides the inherent grossness of commercializing mental health issues in order to sell League of Legends skins, activation and engagement ploys like Seraphine printing out some of the tweets from her most devoted fans to put up on a corkboard and then post about on Twitter how glad she was that all these people truly believe in her is an example of parasocial marketing. Basically, it's marketing that's designed to foster a one-way relationship between an audience and an object of affection. It has been at the core of celebrity marketing since forever. Taylor Swift is especially good at this kind of thing. But it's also one of the basic aspects of influencer marketing. An influencer builds up a relationship with an audience, establishes a certain understanding of authenticity and credibility with them, and then uses that authenticity and credibility to recommend them products that they might like to buy. I did this myself not too long ago with my Pascal's Wager video, a genuinely good souls like that I don't have any trouble recommending, but which I was nonetheless paid to showcase to my audience. The companies that pay for those kinds of promotions do so on the understanding that my audience trusts me not to deceive them and that generally speaking any product that's associated with me will, in their minds, also be associated with, broadly speaking, good things. Hey, this influencer who I like was willing to advertise this video game, so it can't be all bad, right? Now, the obvious question is that if this kind of marketing is so normal, and if you, Skyen, are apparently fine enough with it that you will do it yourself, what's the problem with Seraphine engaging in the same thing? And that's frankly a fair question. Now, first of all, it's important to understand that the word parasocial is not a negative word. If you describe something as a parasocial relationship, you are not saying that it's a bad relationship or that it's toxic or that it's evil. It is a descriptor that lets you know that the relationship is asymmetrical. One side of the relationship, the fan, is expending a lot of time and energy and effort on maintaining the relationship, and the other side of the relationship, the celebrity or influencer or whatever, is largely unaware that any of of this is happening. So, for example, a huge Taylor Swift fan who buys all of her merchandise, attends all of the concerts that they can possibly go to, sings along to all of the lyrics, and knows every single snippet about Taylor Swift's private life that gets published in the press. But Taylor Swift, for her part, doesn't even know that this person exists. She can't, because she has millions and millions and millions of fans, and it's quite literally impossible for her to put as much energy into her relationship with each of her fans as each of her fans put into their relationship with her as a personality. Again, this is not good or bad, it's just the nature of how fan-creator relationships tend to work. Where the problematic aspects begin to enter into it is when an influencer or a celebrity, or a YouTuber for that matter, begins to develop or take advantage of the relationship in ways that are unethical. And usually, this happens in some kind of financialization of the relationship. So, for example, note the difference between saying, hey, I have some merchandise, it is over here, here's a link, you can go there, you can buy it if you want to, versus saying, you know what guys, I'm just so grateful for every single person who buys merchandise for my store, I really feel the love and I know that you guys are my biggest fans and I feel so close to you and I feel like our relationship and our bond and our community is so strong because the merchandise sold out so quickly and I sat down and I cried about it because I was just so happy that everybody wanted to buy my merchandise, it really validates me as a person and it makes me feel so close to you like you're my family. Now, obviously, I'm exaggerating a little bit on that second example, although not as much as I would like to be. But that's one of the toxic ways that a creator can leverage parasocial relationships in order to make money. Imply or create the impression in your audience that they need to do a certain thing to help you in order to validate their relationship to you as a fan, and all of a sudden you can extract all kinds of money, labor, and marketing from your fan base without putting in an iota of work yourself. Now, if you are a creator who struggles with their mental health and you feel like you need some validation from your audience sometimes, like that's just a nice way to boost your brain and get you back into creating content, it's not really that unreasonable of a thing to tweet about that, to say, hey, I've been feeling really low lately, it would be nice to hear something nice, because all you're asking people to do is tweet some nice things at you. Not exactly a huge amount of emotional labor you're demanding out of your audience here. And if you get that validation, 
printing out some of those tweets and putting them up on a corkboard and putting up a thank you post for being so nice to me is a pretty harmless way to operationalize a parasocial relationship. It's like, hey, thank you for being nice to me. I really appreciate it. And just to prove that, I've actually put some real physical work into appreciating the things that you all sent to me. That is, yes, a parasocial marketing exercise from a cynical perspective, but it's not really a toxic one as such. But now imagine that the creator isn't actually having any mental health problems whatsoever, that they lied about it to their fans and got them to send them all those nice words specifically for the purpose of putting them up on a corkboard and posting it on social media to get thousands and thousands of retweets worth of free marketing for their brand and their personality. That is no longer any kind of wholesome and harmless. That's actually exploitative and really fucking gross. So what are we to make of it when a virtual influencer who does not have depression, who cannot in fact feel feelings, attempts this kind of thing? Now it's probably worth it for a second just to step back and define a term here. What exactly is a virtual influencer? And like with many things, it's hard to give an exact cut and dried answer. Depending on your definition, characters like the Gorillas or Hatsune Miku could be argued to be virtual influencers, while others may argue it only applies to wholly artificial characters created specifically for the purpose of being influencers that are trying to pass themselves off as human, like for example, Lil Michaela or Shudu Grab. Personally, I find that the most useful technical definition of a virtual influencer is any character that is used specifically to do parasocial marketing while sidestepping the inconvenient disadvantages of trying to do that kind of marketing with real people. So. Seraphine is a virtual influencer because she's an entirely fictional character who was created for the purposes of doing influencer marketing to the benefit of Riot Games products, specifically League of Legends, KDA, and Worlds. And it's worth pointing out that for the purposes of this discussion, it doesn't really matter whether anyone believes Seraphine is a real person. She doesn't exactly try to look like one, and I don't think the people who responded to her tweets were fooled by her. What matters for the purposes of this discussion is whether Seraphine can have the same effect as a real influencer. And as you can tell by the many, many virtual influencers who are already very successful and raking in millions of dollars in sponsorships and product placement, the answer to that question is very much yes. When Seraphine put out her tweet talking about her bad mental health and her need for validation, hundreds of people gave it to her and she got to post her emotional thank you post where she put their tweets up on a corkboard for maximum social media engagement. Even if every single person who sent her well wishes was only doing it because, hey, it's a fun way to participate in some social media storytelling, the end result from the perspective of Riot's marketing is exactly the same. They get the same benefit. They extract the same value from the interaction. Similarly, it also doesn't really matter if the mental health struggle that Seraphine articulates is being written from a place of authenticity by whoever happens to be writing her tweets. And as we found out, once there actually started to be a little bit of a controversy around this, Bethany Higa, the person at Riot who wrote for Seraphine, was very much drawing on her own personal experience to craft the way that Seraphine expressed her struggles. And if Seraphine had been an act of role-playing or a bit of creative fiction writing just happening through the medium of tweets on Twitter.com, that would probably be fine, and the authenticity of the writer's experience would add something to the artistic nature of that project. But that's not what Seraphine is. Seraphine is a virtual influencer, and her purpose was to drum up social media attention for the KDA skins, the KDA music, League of Legends esports, and League of Legends as a product and IP. And in that context, no matter the intentions of the writer, no matter how authentic a place it was coming from, faking mental health struggles in a fictional character in order to draw attention to a marketing campaign for an esports event and a skin line is, in my personal opinion, not ethical behavior. In fact, it's kind of gross. And again, I don't think Bethany Higa was trying in any way to be malicious. She just happened to exist in a context within which no amount of authenticity and sincerity on her part could change the unethical nature of the dynamic that is ultimately at play. And this ties into a broader discussion about virtual influencers and specifically the motivations for companies to take advantage of them. Because virtual influencers believe nothing. 
They have no personalities except what they happen to be given by their creators at any given point in time. They have no ethics. They have no morality. They have no internal moral compass. They never get tired. They never refuse to work. They never call attention to bad working conditions because they can't. They never out sexual abusers. They can't me too anyone. And if they ever manage to cause any kind of controversy, it's either a calculated intentional move to drum up attention, or if it happens on accident, all you have to do is say, oops, that was a mistake on the part of our writers and our artists who run these accounts. Those invisible people whose names you will never learn and don't care about have been fired. Please continue to enjoy the products being sold by our virtual influencer who will always believe in whatever social values we think are most marketable right now. And let me give you an example of how that shit can play out in real life. So, one of the most popular virtual influencers in the world right now is Little Michaela. In the bio on Instagram, Little Michaela has the following words. Hashtag Black Lives Matter. Here is Little Michaela posing next to another virtual influencer called Bermuda is Bay. Now, she doesn't have quite as big of a platform, but there sure is some interesting information in her bio on the virtual influencer database, Virtual Humans. <clears throat> Bermuda is an LA it girl, an aspiring musician who identifies as a robot woman. Bermuda is on a mission to change the world and is quoted as saying, I want to inspire young entrepreneurs to pursue their business dreams, particularly if it centers on the intersection of tech and beauty. I'd also love to encourage more women to pursue careers in robotics, a field historically marred and clouded by the sexism of its inventors. Bermuda used to be a Trump supporter, a stance that created significant drama between her, Michaela, and Blocko. On the topic of drama, she used to date Blocko. Bermuda has released a single on Spotify, a cover of Under the Bridge by Red Hot Chili Peppers. Bermuda is the project of Brood, founded by Trevor McFedries and Sarah Deku. In addition to Bermuda, Brood also created Blocko and Lil Michaela. Bermuda and her friends are represented by PR firm Huxley and have been invested in by Spark Capital, Sequoia Capital, M Ventures, Box Group, Chris Williams, Founders Fund, and WME. So let me just recap what the fuck happened there. This company, Brood, have created two virtual influencers, Lil Michaela and Bermuda. Lil Michaela, in her bio, proudly proclaims that she believes in Black Lives Matter, while the same company at the same time is running a different Instagram account called Bermuda, who they play up as a freaking Trump supporter. Not because they believe in Black Lives Matter, not because they believe in anything that President Trump did in his time in office, thank God it's over, but because creating fake drama between their fake virtual influencers is a good way to drum up engagement. And at the center of this diseased web of fake drama between fake people who don't have any morality and couldn't take an ethical stance if they tried, sits a fucking hive of capitalist vultures raking in the cash from both sides of the conflict and deciding to change Bermuda away from being a Trump supporter the moment it is no longer commercially viable to keep her as one. And do they give a quarter of a shit about the black people who routinely get murdered by American police? No. Do they give a quarter of a shit about building the wall or draining the swamp or any of the other lies that President Trump used to tell his supporters? No. They don't care about the values that they're promoting. They don't care who gets hurt by the values that they're promoting. All that they care about is that making their robot fake people influencers pretend to have those values makes the line go up on their profit graph. That is the fucking landfill of slimy, exploitative hypocrisy that underpins the mechanics of virtual influencers. They exist as a concept, so marketers can fully exploit every possible avenue of engagement and revenue without ever having to deal with the inconveniences that come with real human influencers like ethics, morality, politics, values, or basic fucking decency. Now, I'm not the world's biggest fan of influencer marketing, even though it's technically part of my own goddamn job, but a human influencer at least can be held accountable for their actions and their beliefs. They at least can be thrown in prison if they break the law, and the only reason virtual influencers exist is because it's inconvenient to capitalism to be bound by the values and limitations of basic fucking humanity. So to bring all of this back around to Seraphine, Riot did about the only ethical thing that it is possible to do with a virtual influencer. 
they stopped using her. After the Ultimate Skins had launched, after Worlds had finally happened, after the KDA music project had run its course in the marketing, after everything that Seraphine was meant to promote had already been promoted and they were done with her, Seraphine's accounts uploaded a final goodbye message and have since then stopped posting. Related to that, a couple of days earlier, Seraphine's primary writer, Bethany Higa, posted the following. I plan to tell my full side of the story sometime soon. For now, I want to clarify that my intention was simply to write an interactive story about a girl who pursues her dreams. There was no board of execs scheming to create a relatable girl or capitalize on mental illness. I spent all of 2020 pouring my heart into this project, and so did my teammates. My goal was always to write a story that touched upon empathy, sincerity, and kindness. I genuinely cared about all the people who interacted, and I wanted to use this platform to uplift them. Social media is a new medium for storytelling with unpredictable real-world impact. There are things we learned about the process and are still learning, but we always took our responsibility to her fans seriously. Please don't harass any of the people who worked on this project or any of her fans. I understand it can feel good to take a shot at a fictional character or a faceless corporation, but those words hurt real people. Think before assuming the worst about us. There have already been several articles presenting misleading information, speculation about my personal life slash mental state, and purposeful misinterpretation of our intentions. All I can ask is that you use your best judgment when reading about this controversy. For those who enjoyed Seraphine, thank you sincerely for your care and support. No matter what, the story is ending soon, and I hope you can enjoy the ending. And frankly, I have no problem believing what Miss Higa is saying here. I believe 100% that for her, this was a creative writing project, a chance to explore the ways that storytelling can be done on social media, a chance to reach out and connect with fans of League of Legends and hopefully create a positive, uplifting, happy space for people to interact with. I 110% fully believe that from her perspective, she wasn't engaging in some kind of cynical marketing exercise. She was trying to do good creative work with an opportunity that was given to her. Seraphine's writer and the artists who worked on all the pictures that she posted are not heartless monsters. They are not evil people who were trying to capitalize on the freedom of a virtual influencer to circumvent all bounds of good taste and ethics. But Miss Higa and her team aren't a corporation. They aren't Riot Games Incorporated, one of the biggest games companies on the face of the earth. They aren't the company who, for almost a decade, allowed rampant sexism, discrimination, homophobia, transphobia, and God knows what else to go on in their workplaces with absolutely no consequences. They aren't the company that still, to this fucking day, employs Scott Gelb as the chief operating officer of the company, despite multiple credible accusations that he groped his employees' genitals in the fucking halls. Allegations, by the way, which Riot owned up to. They said, yes, Scott has definitely acted in inappropriate ways, but he's just such a valuable leader, we're gonna give him two weeks unpaid vacation and right the fuck back to work he went. Miss Higa and her team aren't the company who just last year attempted to accept a partnership with a Saudi Arabian city building project that is not only helmed by Mohammed bin Salman, a man who was responsible for untold human rights violations as well as the assassination of journalists who disagree with him, but a city project that's fully known to be built on human rights violations, violently displacing the indigenous tribal people who live on the land that the Saudis want for their vainglorious mega city. It took the entire on-screen talent of the LEC threat threatening to publicly walk out and refuse to be on the broadcast before Riot decided to back down from that sponsorship. So while I fully believe that the rioters who worked on Seraphine had no malicious intentions and were just trying to create something good and fun that the players could enjoy, and largely succeeded at that, by the way, that project is still owned by Riot Games Incorporated, and nobody should ever trust a corporation. And I almost want to apologize to the rioters whose work I make a little bit of a living out of criticizing on this channel because I can't receive their work in the spirit that it is given. Because all of this nonsense that we've just gone through, it spooks about in my head and I can't make myself not think about it. <sighs> 
None of this means you can't enjoy Seraphine. None of this means you're not allowed to think that Seraphine the Virtual Influencer was a fun time at good positive experience on Twitter.com. None of it means you're not allowed to enjoy yourself. There is no ethical consumption under capitalism. The best we can do is just keep giving the corporation sh shit for all their failures and try and get some enjoyment out of the nice things that their employees create. Seraphine is fine. Unionize the games industry. Rant over, I guess. Hey, thank you very much for watching this long, weird episode of What's the Deal With? You may have noticed that there were no animation segments in this episode, and that's because, well, the video was kind of getting long enough already, and the animation segments are usually the longest part, so if you'd like to see them, let me know down in the comments, and maybe I'll do a separate supplemental video where we take a look at Seraphine's animation. There's actually a lot of good stuff there to talk about, but this video has to be done now, because I want to get it finished so I can move on to Rel, so I can move on to Viego, who I'm actually really excited to talk about, and I really need to get a video out about him before the Ruined King game drops all of a sudden, because Riot are trying to kill me. They're just, they're just trying to kill me. That's what they're trying to do, and I will not let them win. Anyway, if you've enjoyed the video, well, it is my parasocial duty as a social media influencer to tell you that you can hit the like, comment, and subscribe buttons down below to let the algorithm know that I did a good job making a video which caused you to engage with it, because, well, that's, that's how the business of this stuff works, unfortunately. I also have a Patreon, a merchandise store, and a tip jar. Oh yes, plenty of monetization options available as well. If you want to use any of them, then I'm very grateful for the help, but if you are not in a position to be able to, which is pretty normal, or hell, if you just don't want to, that is honestly completely okay. At the end of my videos, though, I do try to encourage people in general to support the content that they enjoy with direct contributions of whatever you can, whenever you can, especially if you're a fan of smaller or niche content creators, because a one or two dollar donation can quite literally be the same as thousands of views on a video. And it makes so much more of a difference than you might think. Whether it's me or someone else, if there is online content that you enjoy, please consider supporting it directly with anything you can, whenever you can. But seriously, never let anyone like me, no matter how sincere and genuine we seem, pressure you into spending money on anything that we do. Only spend what you can comfortably afford to, and if you can't comfortably afford to spend any money, then never feel guilt for not being able to. Anyway, I'll stop preaching now and get back to self-promotion. Yay, I have a second channel. I do Let's Plays over there. I include a bunch of analysis in those as well. So if you want something longer form to watch, then I've got playthroughs going on of Breath of the Wild. There's going to be new episodes of my Diablo playthrough coming up soon. And people broadly seem to be enjoying my playthrough of Hades as well. So, you know, like, comment, subscribe over there as well. And now I am done. Thank you very much for watching. Please remember to wear a mask and wash your hands. And when the vaccine comes, I am begging of you all to please take it and try to act in solidarity with those who are working to make the world a better place.